Okay, so uh, it's three o'clock and we start our online symposium. So welcome everyone to our online symposium with the title Using Research to Impact Counseling and Psychotherapy Practice and Mental Health Policy, <clears throat> which is obviously part of the launch event series for the new Open Psychology Research Center uh, this week. My name is Andreas Vossler and together with my colleague Naomi Moller, I have organized this event uh, today for the psychology of health and well-being strand of the new research center. And we are very happy that we were able to organize the event jointly with the UK chapter of the Society of Psychotherapy Research. And also we are very pleased to have speakers from the British Association for Counseling and Psychotherapy, BACP, uh, taking part in the symposium. We will introduce the speakers who are involved in this event as and when they appear in the course of the next two hours. So the idea with this event um, is about thinking about research impact in counseling and psychotherapy. Uh, <clears throat> so if you look at the research, um, the website of the, of the new Open Psychology Research Center, it says there, um, Research aim our research aims to make a difference. We can, by the way, go to the, the, the first slide, Sam. Aims to make a difference within real lives. Um, it also aims to speak to the current societal issues and problems and aims to inform professional practice. So if you think about that, that seems all pretty clear and straightforward. If possible, research should be used to inform practice and policy. But as with many things, the reality is often not so simple and straightforward. For example, amongst practitioners, there can often be a suspicion of research and of the notion and demands of evidence proving evidence. And amongst academics, academics might feel a bit unease about the term impact and how it seems to have been instrumentalized in the context, context of the research exercise framework. And academics therefore rather sometimes like to talk about engaging or engaged research rather than research impact. And then of course, there is also the question, what counts as evidence? So what is considered as evidence that counts to impact practice and policies and what not? So the aim with this symposium is to delve a bit more in these kind of com complex debates around research impact. And we are doing this by and the, the first, first part of the symposium showcasing two recent uh, research initiatives that were aimed at impacting counseling and psychotherapy policy and or practice in the UK. And then in the, in the later, later part of the symposium, we are discussing the possibilities and challenges of research and campaigns which aim to impact counseling and psychotherapy policy and practice. And we are using kind of three questions that will guide us uh, in, in our discussions. So these are how can research knowledge and expertise be used to address real world issues and impact on counseling and psychotherapy practice? What are the conditions needed to achieve research impact that can make a difference in mental health policy? And what lessons can we learn from existing research in initiatives and campaigns? So this is a brief introduction and I'm handing over now to Naomi to talk us through the content uh, of the session. Next slide, please. Thanks so much, Andreas. So um, I'm not going to spend very long here, but just to say that our next um, uh, piece will be a piece from Felicitas talking about um, the work that she's done as uh, leading a campaign that's very important, I think, in terms of um, counselling funding and counselling and psychotherapy practice in the UK. Um, the second uh, half, if you like, or second, third, maybe, of um, our, our uh, symposium is around um, 
this piece of work that uh, Andreas and myself did with BOCP, um, which is looking at the needs of practitioners in terms of research informed continuing professional development. So online learning and other kinds of learning for, for professionals. And then the last thing that we're going to do is we're going to have a panel discussion. So we've got different bits of interactivity through um, the uh, presentations and um, we're really hoping that you will uh, contribute to that because that will also then inform the discussions that we're having. We'd really like to hear from you. Next slide, please. So I'm not going to do a, a long introduction to D D Dr. Rost, but just to say that um, she's currently research lead at the Tavistock and Portman NHS Foundation. Um, she's a past president of the Society of Psychotherapy Research in the UK, and she was awarded in 2019 for her work um, in terms of professional leadership in, precisely for this very important work that she's going to be talking about right now. OK, so Sam, um, if you can stop sharing at this point and Felicitas, if you want to share on the corner, the right. Oh, I can always muddle up my left and my right. On the right hand corner, you'll see a box with a little upward arrow in it. If you click on that and you then uh, that's it. Perfect. Can you see that? Yes. Yes, we can. Thanks. <clears throat> Great. OK, I, I can't see anyone now, but I'm. Um, Going, I'm um, going ahead. I'm going to start, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right. Great. Thank you very much for inviting me and for being here. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk about the nice stakeholder campaign and I'm going to focus in the sense of, or I'm going to provide a story or a narrative of why, why this group of stakeholders believes um, why the nice draft guideline for depression treatment is not fit for purpose. And in a way, you know, it, it will become evident um, how, you know, that one of the reasons for that is in a sense of how they have used the research evidence. Can you see that it's moving? Yeah, we can see the next slide, just the title so far. So let me start. Um, in a sense, I do believe that there is a need for treatment guidelines and the reason for for that is that, you know, by the 1980s, there were more than 150 psychotherapies. By the 1996, more than 450. And by the year 2000, over a thousand different named psychotherapies. So given the, um, the, the huge increase um, over the past um, decades in available psychotherapies, I think there is a need for a systematic appraisal of these, especially in a health system that stresses informed practice and shared decision making. It's paramount. And one of the early drivers behind the development of clinical guidelines were the challenges in properly reviewing, synthesizing and evaluating treatment um, evidence or relevant evidence. And um, when I started to develop treatment guidelines for mental health um, problems, it was an important endeavor. So just very briefly, the definition of a treatment guideline is that it is a systematically developed, that these are systematically developed statements to assist practitioner and patient decisions about appropriate health care for specific clinical circumstances. However, as um, Steve Pilling has stressed in a paper in 2008, guidelines also now have a role in determining the means by which the agreed resources for treatment are allocated. In other words, NICE endeavours to determine cost effectiveness as well as clinical effectiveness. And I will say a little bit about that in my conclusion. Pilling also points out that, in, that, it is, that an important characteristics, characteristic of high quality clinical guideline, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, goodness. Um, sorry, so important characteristic of high quality clin clinical guideline um, is, you know, it, it had, that the method needs to be transparent and well, well described. However, I would like to argue on half of the coalition um, that with respect to the depression guideline, this has not been the case. All stakeholders received a revised version of the depression guideline that was in 2009. So during my presidential term for the Society for Psychotherapy Research UK chapter, I initiated a working group to review these. I thought we would be actually quite well placed 
because of our expertise in, in research methodology and design, but also because the society is actually a multimodal. Um, we are multimodal. And as such, we can actually approach these guidelines from a position of therapeutic neutrality and scientific integrity. So having reviewed the, the first draft guideline with a scientific lens during the summer of 2017, we actually found ourselves extremely concerned, actually shocked, if you'd like. So in addition to a lack of transparency and several inconsistencies, we detected various serious methodological flaws. And it became actually apparent that if the guideline were to be published as they were, and as they still are, I have to point out, it would lead to misleading treatment recommendations. So we decided we had to do something. And we reached out to other stakeholders in order to challenge NICE on this. So the coalition grew very fast and it involves now over 40, I think it's 45 of as of today, I tried to count them earlier because stakeholders are still joining the campaign. And so we're over 41 or 43 um, stakeholders now, including all major UK health professional bodies. So bringing together psychologists, psychiatrists, GPs, psychotherapies of all approaches, researchers and significant patient bodies. We also went to Parliament and spoke to various parliamentarians and, and um, MPs and peers. And with the support from over 60 MPs and peers, our pressure led to an unprecedented achievement. So we first um, achieved a second consultation on this very first draft. And then after more campaigning, finally to a third revision of the proposed guidelines, because the the second draft that we that we fought for so hard actually didn't include any of the changes that we wanted or needed them to do. Just very briefly for those who are not familiar with the with the process, um, when a guideline um, comes out or when you know when a draft guideline is done, it get stakeholders have about six weeks to review it. So there's one revision period and where stakeholders get to see it. So you can make your comments and your 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 observations. However, it is then at the dis discretion of NICE or the, or the, to decide which comments to take into account and which not. And you'd actually normally don't know whether your comments have been taken into account or not until the, gui uh, until the guideline has already been published. So we obviously were very concerned about that and we fought very hard for that second um, consultation period. And then for a third, um, given that they actually haven't made any changes. So, this is where this is where we're at at the moment. The draft guideline is being reviewed, is being revised a third time, and we are receiving the draft guideline. You know, obviously, Corona happened. There's been a delay, but we are um, at the moment um, due to receive it in in November for a period of six weeks in order to review it and in order to see whether they actually have included the changes that we want them to include. And we really hope that they would adequately address our concerns. So the stakeholder coalition is driven by and coming from a position of psychotherapeutic neutrality and scientific integrity, just as the development of the guideline actually should be. Our concerns are directed towards the methodology adopted or adhered to. Specifically, our concerns are related to their selection their grouping and their analysis of the research evidence. We're also arguing that the evidence-based practice paradigm needs to be adjusted for mental health guidelines that involves a mixture of both medical and psychological treatments. That is not the case at the moment, but that's, that's one of the positions that we are arguing from. So these are the six method key methodological flaws. There were many other points or concerns that each of our organization respectively have raised. Um, however, these are the six that we folk that we basically agreed upon as the coalition of 42 um, um, stakeholders. So these are what we felt the main key issues that all need to be addressed. So not one or two or three of them can be addressed, but all of them need to be addressed. And that's what we've been trying to raise with NICE ever since, um, you know, the summer 2017. And we had a couple of very helpful meetings and, um, you know, in which we, in which we argued our
um, they're all equally important and all, you know, all of them, um, if not addressed, will to our um, mind make this, this guideline not fit for purpose. So I will very briefly um, go over the, the, the six points. Um, the, the position statement is available if you wanted to read them in more detail. I'll just summarise them for, for you. So the, the first point that we're arguing is, that the, is about the proposed categorization of depression. The definition is still descriptive and symptom based rather than explanatory. But it appears even more reductionist than before, like in the 2009 guideline, as they now got rid of the three categories, mild, moderate and severe. And they propose um, to divide the trial po populations by dichotomizing baseline severity as more severe and less severe, using actually a method that has not been validated. So in other words, there is no evidence of the validity of that dichotomy. Furthermore, NICE draws a distinction and therefore conducts um, separate reviews or analyses between chronic depression, treatment-resistant depression and complex depression. So this would not only be out of step with the US um, and European guideline, guideline methodologies, furthermore, there is again no evidence that warrants these distinctions and in doing so would actually lead to erroneous and unhelpful classifications and therefore erroneous and unhelpful treatment recommendations. The second concern are around the inclusion and exclusion criteria. They use the grade system, and but they apply it without adapting it, despite the complex endeavour of um, comparing psychological and medical treatments. And we, we argue that it needs to be adapted. The current draft guideline has an extremely narrow focus on symptom outcome and fails to take into account other aspects of um, what actually service users um, um, prefer or have, have been called for. Um, such as quality of life, uh, relationships, ability to participate in work, education and society. Furthermore, in this guideline, long term follow up data is not included. And A, to demonstrate if effects can be sustained, important for depression as we all know depression can be long term depression can be relapsing it is one of those conditions but also b to meet principle of parity of steam with physical health in other words the current draft recommendations are all made on the basis of very short term outcomes often six to twelve weeks and always less than one year so this is inadequate um, or as a basis for recommendations for long term conditions whether physical or men um, mental conditions, actually. So when you look at NICE guidelines for long term physical conditions, they um, would treat this evidence as inadequate and always argue it requires at least a one or two year follow up um, data. So it is in, for us actually in, incomprehensible why they haven't included um, long term data. And we are arguing it really needs to be included when we know where it is obviously available. The next concerns how they anal an analyze the evidence. So NICE proposes to use um, um, network meta-analysis, which is um, a meta-analysis in which multiple treatments are being compared using both direct comparisons of interventions within RCTs and indirect comparisons across tri trials based on common um, comparators. So in other words, it uses trials that have been actually carried out in real life and then those that haven't. And whilst it is um, it is a fantastic you know, statistical method that we have at our disposal and it deals with some of the disadvantages of meta analysis, there are serious concerns and unique risks associated with this with this methodology that actually need addressing for it to be a valid um, analysis approach. And we found looking looking at the um, looking at the draft, we found that not all of the issues were actually adequately addressed and therefore um, violating. Sorry, that's the next point, actually. Therefore, sort of violating um, underlying assumptions. 
um, in this case, assumptions of transitivity and consistency. So, you know, in this particular network meta-analysis, at least in the second draft, I don't know what, what it will be like in the third draft, but they included 351 studies and they compared 81 interventions and combinations of interventions, which considered consider, uh, differed considerably, which is a real problem using network meta-analysis. And also, you know, um, you know, I, other important um, scientists or, you know, for example, the Canadian Agency for Drug and Technologies in Health, they warn against using network meta-analysis um, as it's so, you know, on its own. And they argue you should only be using it as a supplementary evidence for direct comparisons. So we are arguing that um, that they shouldn't be using this 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 analysis for the complex um, for such a complex um, yeah, for such, you know, such a complex analysis. The next point is that we're arguing that the methods for determining treatment effects are also inadequate. So the current draft uh, guideline um, basically looks at full remission. Is full remission um, achieved? But it's actually really difficult to achieve full remission from a severe baseline. Um, it, it's difficult to achieve. So when you might argue, whereas a treatment which helps some service users actually move from severe depression to mild or moderate depression, is that could could be worth um, recommending actually. So partial remission, but also you know having a change as such would be worth recommending. And there are actually established ways, validated ways of calculating clinical effect sizes or clinically significant change on continuous data. Um, and they have not included that. So we are arguing that they really need to include that as well. Very briefly, I won't go into detail. There's a lot to say about this, but this is a very important point. Ensuring that the views and the experiences of those who use the services are properly taken into account should be the sin, um, sine non qua non of publicly funded bodies. It needs to be included. The review of the evidence of service users' experience was not updated. So the section copied over from the 2009 guideline was actually in itself also inadequate. I, I won't go into detail in how far. However, it was important that they, you know, that they did update the service user um, experience section. So we made a case for that and we argued for that. After, um, after you know, several, you know, after our back and forth with them, they sort of agreed, okay, we're going to do that. However, it transpired then that they're actually including now, they're proposing to include a review on patient choice. And whilst this isn't, well, it is an important area for investigation to look at patient choice, but what, what is really needed for a guideline like that is a systematic review and integration of studies investigating patient or service users' experience of the psychological and medical treatments reviewed in this guideline. And that's what they're not going to do. So there's an important distinction to be made between making general decisions on which psychotherapeutic interventions are the most effective and making contextually sensitive decisions on which, which interventions will be effective or appropriate for which particular service users. And we don't believe the, um, that the present version nor the suggested changes for the third revision of the guideline adequately addresses the latter considerations. And thus will not provide sufficient guidance for clinicians about making contextually sensitive referrals. Right, so the, the, these are, you know, in, in obviously <laughs> summarize the, the six um, key methodological issues that we we need nice uh, you know to change on this guy in this guideline to make it um, a guideline that is fit for purpose that we can actually rely upon that we can use and as you know it's probably more important than ever now increase in depression over over the COVID so by the time that the guideline comes out which is um, at the moment um, proposed to be in, in in March next year by that time we will need a guideline that is fit for purpose in order to really address the the increases in depression that we that we're seeing um, drastically at the moment 
So, but what if the methodology is not changed? So, the guideline will limit patient choice. It will force a U-turn on the progress made in providing equity of access to a wide range of psychological therapies. It will restrict patient choice and shared decision-making stressed by the NHS reform. And it will discriminate against psychological therapies in spite of service users preference over pharmacological alternatives. So by default, some treatments are favored over others based on methodological choices rather than based on effectiveness or evidence of effectiveness. And that is very important. So by default, patients or safe service users will be offered a limited selection of treatments and as a consequence, some will be offered treatments that may not be helpful to them. And to us, to the stakeholder coalition, this remains a serious concern that needs to be addressed for a treatment guideline to be fit for purpose. So we are arguing, and some of the points I'm arguing, um, there is a need for sea change. We need a new paradigm for this guideline, and I'm arguing also for other guidelines. We need a paradigm that considers the historical and sociological forces that shape the reality it operates in. That takes the complexity of mental phenomena and psychological treatment serious. It accepts that problems with external validity are inescapable and therefore regards randomized controlled trials only as one part of the research cycle that gets rid of the arbitrary and unhelpful hierarchy of evidence um, and, 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 and the need to rank order treatments and combines data and findings from a range of research methodologies. So creating sound public policy requires that we draw on a diverse range of evidence, not only on our evidence derived from RCTs. Good models one that seeks to integrate scientific knowledge, clinical judgment and expertise. And by expertise, I'm also referring to the experience of those who, ex who, who have depression and who have tried several treatments and can give us their expert advice on what has helped and hasn't helped for them. In methodological terms, case study and qualitative evidence should inform existing guidelines as part of a multi-level synthesis and not just be supplementary, um, but should actually be really integrated into the treatment recommendations. And this is my point, so perhaps not everyone in the coalition agrees with me, but I would like to point out or I would like to share my opinion that I think treatment guidelines or NICE should not, the treatment guidelines should not play a role in determining cost effectiveness. I think it should be separate. I think it is important, obviously, in, 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 in today's society, and especially in an overstretched NHS, um, to look, you know, that treatment is cost effective. However, it should not be together, it should not be, you know, sort of determined at the same time as clinical effectiveness. Moreover, what NICE does is it makes decisions. It makes decisions when cost effectiveness overrides clinical effectiveness. And I don't think that NICE should be, or that shouldn't be the place where decisions of such kind are made. They can calculate the cost effectiveness and the clinical effectiveness if they wanted to, but it should be someone else who makes the decision about which overrides which. Sorry, that's my opinion. Right. My next point I would like to make, and a call for scientific rigor and integrity, I think it is pivotal that we remind, rem that we remind organizations such as NICE that they ought to keep scientific equipoise and integrity. So that means that before a novel measure, a criteria, a technique can be used, it needs to undergo the rigorous, the usual rigorous validation tests carried out within the scientific community. No organization should be exempt from such an approach. So if a development group develops a new methodology, as was the case in the depression guideline, they too need to be published and peer reviewed um, and scrutinized adequately before they can be applied and used. I mean, we all have to adhere to that. 
So NICE2 needs to adhere to that. So I, I argue that this includes the grouping of depression, and I also argue that it includes the use of network meta-analysis. As I've just pointed out earlier, an analysis of that kind has never been done, has never been piloted using network meta-analysis. And it's really interesting, actually, just by, by you know, as an anecdote, when I looked at all the evidence, um, sorry, when I looked at papers using network meta-analysis, and I was sort of curious, what, what is their justification, their published justification for using network meta-analysis? And what I found was that some of them justify the use of network meta-analysis because NICE is using it, NICE is advocating it. So, it's incredible, actually, because a method seems to become established not because of scientific rigor, but because of an autocratic voice. And that, that, that's not right either. So methods chosen need to be transparent, clearly outlined and justified. And in the case of utilization of a new model, as I said, it needs to be, um, it needs to be clearly stated as well as limitations need to be explained. Again, that's something we, we really pushed NICE to, to do. Finally, our experiences of the stakeholder involvement or the campaign has really shown how important proper stakeholder involvement is. We urged NICE to review the process of stakeholder involvement um, to become more than a simple tick box exercise um, when they actually reviewed their method guideline in, in when was that a couple of years ago? And we really urge them to include that. So, for example, we asked them, all of our stakeholders um, asked them to make a second consultation common practice, to allow a dialogue between stakeholders and the development group as, as a common practice, so that they can actually fulfill their role to provide quality assurance and peer review properly. Unfortunately, they have not implemented that change. Right, conclusion. So the ambition to recommend as few treatments as possible or to identify the most effective treatment for depression or actually for any other mental health condition ignores our knowledge that a one size fits all for health is untenable. Research has shown again and again that a range of psychotherapies are effective and overall actually as effect, are effective with an overall effect size of 0.8, which is really good. So it means, but you know, when comparing um, psychotherapy versus no treatment. So this means that on average, patients receiving psychotherapy will be better off than 79% of those not receiving treatment. It also means nearly three quarters of patients who have psychotherapy are better off than those left to recover by themselves. So the number needed to treat is three. Effect size is a number where very slightly for, for, for adult depression and also in terms of the number needed to, tr to treat, so ranging between four and six. However, just to remind everyone of the, you know, just a couple of examples that these are really good number needed to treat um, sizes. So, for example, the number needed to treat for antibiotics for an eye infection are t is, t is 12. Um, the number needed to treat for statins to prevent a heart attack is 60. So I guess the number needed to treat between four and six is pretty good. Also, what Vampold has pointed out, um, and actually in his recent um, presidential address, he made a big point of that um, at the SBR conference, that superiority effects between, between different treatments are actually negligible. There are a few, but overall, you know, we show again and again that one treatment is not superior to another treatment for specific disorders. So I think, we think, society ought to offer a choice of treatments. However, our research by overemphasizing the importance of evidence of treatment efficacy, so as I said, which assumes it's the particular treatment model that matters, we ignore many of the other significant variables that determine treatment outcome, you know, therapist's effects, pre-treatment patient characteristics, the combination and dynamic of both. So I think our research endeavors ought to be directed towards a systematic examination of who benefits and who does not from which treatment and therapist and at what particular point in their lives in order to help guide treatment recommendations better. 
But in so doing, we need to find a way of how we can honour the complexity and multidimensionality involved. I think clinicians are familiar with this complex, but I don't share their often expressed scepticism that we can't find an empirical way to get hold of it. So to my mind, we could make a start by stopping to devalue the other methodologies that we don't happen to support or believe in and stop creating arbitrary dichotomies between research methodologies. This methods design and the synthesis of findings from different methodologies is needed. Mental health guidelines, including medical and psychological treatments, in turn need to adapt similarly, and we need to move away from this current evidence-based approach that is shaped by medical science. Okay. Very much for your attention. And please spread the word about the campaign. <laughs> Our um, um, position statement is available on the SBR website. And also, if you email me, I'm happy to forward that to you. And if you happen to know a stakeholder organization who hasn't got their, their beautiful logo on our statement, be in touch and um, let me know and we'll approach them. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, um, Phyllis Tess. Um, I'm going to ask um, you to perhaps stop sharing and maybe get um, Sam to share in due course, but um, uh, maybe not just immediately. Maybe we can. Um, I don't know, Felicitas, if you've, if your camera is working. Um, if it is, it would be lovely um, to see your face. Um, uh, so we have some time now for a few questions. Um, so uh, we have a question um, from Steph, Steph Taylor, um, who asks, do you think the problems you identify with the NICE guideline for depression have parallel in NICE guidelines for the treatment of other conditions, or is this a situation that's particular to mental health? Okay, yeah, it's a, it's a really important question. I think some of, I mean, you know, I guess some of the very specific issues that we're raising are relevant to this guideline. You know, some of the methodological issues obviously it won't be relevant. However, some of the, the sort of broader aspects that we're raising are, are to, to our mind, to my mind, relevant for all guidelines. You know, for example, the, the sole focus on randomized controlled trials. You know, I think, you know, I think that that is, or, you know, the, the move away from the sole fo focus, I think is important for all guidelines. Um, I mean, what is important, I guess, what we're raising here, that this is a treatment guideline that uses a mixture of treatments. So it isn't a guideline that just looks at antidepressants, for example. It looks at various medications and it looks at various treatment, psychological treatments. And that is applicable for other guidelines, too. So I think if you're having a mixture of treatments, you're making it really complex. So that's an argument against using network meta-analysis also in other guidelines. So the more complex your analysis, the, 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 the more difficult it gets and the more um, careful you need to, to be in order to kind of um, allow the, um, the, 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 the statistics that you use to be valid. So again, that's another argument, mm -hmm. for example, other guy. Um, we've got another question, but I just wanted to do a quick follow up on that. Um, mm -hmm. um, one of the things I've always been struck by with the NICE guideline um, for depression but also with the hierarchy of evidence is that nice guideline becomes the when it when it comes out becomes the framework through which uh, mental health services in england and partly in wales um, are then commissioned it's what dictates what happens in iap services um, and yet it's very odd because they won't use or look at the IAPT data and what the IAPT data is actually showing. So we've got a set of guidelines that set up a particular kind of service, and then we've got all this data on what's happening in the services, which they won't look at. And I always think that's just really odd because it seems like you would be closing a research circle. Um, but NICE has been very clear with us as a, as a group of stakeholders that it's not prepared to use what um, psychotherapists refer to as um, practice based evidence. So evidence that actually comes from their own practice. And it just seems bizarre to me mm -hmm. that you will prefer data that comes from uh, research trials, often which are quite small relatively, and which may not be happening in the UK context, so happening potentially with quite different populations, to this huge data set of the practice in the NHS, which you know, just seems just 
mind boggling to me that that's there, there's a sort of such a sort of reliance on RCTs and a refusal to use other kinds of data. But I, anyway, that's my kind of my so uh, that's my kind of what's the word hobby horse. Um, I don't know what your, your feeling is about that, Felicitas. I, I feel very similar, as you know, Naomi. I think, you know, just to kind of be a little bit just to, you know, just to sort of play devil's advocate a little bit. And I think this is where, you know, where we where the you know, it's easy to say we need to synthesize the different kinds of evidence. We also need to kind of develop ways of how to go about it. They have been over the last 10 years, so NICE can't use this as an excuse anymore because there have actually been published ways of doing that. So, you know, over the last years, a lot has been developed, but we need to do a lot more. You know, how, how do we... In control T's with qualitative data, how, how do we synthesize all of that? Okay, that's that's really important. It sounds like Andreas has a question. Andreas, Move I just wanted to that direction. I'm so sorry, uh, Philistas. It sounds like I talked over you. I think there's been a little little issue with the with the sound just there. Yeah. Um, so I know Andres has a question. Sorry, Andres. I just wanted to put in a comment from um, feed in a comment from Fiona Ballantyne Dykes, who is um, Fiona. I'm going to muddle up your title, but very very important person in the British Association of Cancer <laughs> Psychotherapy, and we welcome you. Thank you very much for for, for being um, with us today. Um, who mentions that the APPG, the um, All Party Parliamentary Group on Prescribed Drug Dependency, have the same concerns, particularly about the exclusion of patient experience in developing the NICE guidelines. Um, so, the, And she also says thank you very much for a very good presentation. So I'm turning to Andreas. Uh, yeah, thanks, Felicitas. Uh, really, really interesting and great overview. Uh, I have a question that moves us a little bit more into lessons learned from a successful campaign, which we will discuss later on a bit more. So thinking about the NICE stakeholder campaign, I know that you are spear spearheading the campaign, and I know that you're quite research knowledgeable. You know a lot about, as I, as I understand, a lot about statistics and those complex uh, statistical statistics statistical procedures. So my question is, um, in terms of ingredients for a successful campaign team, how important is it to have people in the campaign team, maybe leading a campaign team, that are kind of know the language, know the, you know, the, the, know the game, if you want, and can then criticize from within? So just an example, I do remember, I mean, RCTs have always been criticized by practitioners. But there was a, an outcry, I think, when a, a, a really famous research team that did RCTs published a paper criticizing RCTs from within, and that was that you know that that drew a lot of attention. It seems to be quite powerful if that happens. So, what do you think? Is it how important is it to have someone in a campaign team who really knows the game and knows the language? Yeah. Yes, I mean, I'd be interested to have other people's views on that. I, I do think it is important. And it is important for, for, for one, one reason that comes to my mind, um, which is applicability. So, you know, that's why I've said, I mean, I, you know, as someone who is who is quite interested in statistics for my sense, <laughs> I, I actually think that network meta-analysis is quite a, a beautiful, quite an interesting methodology. You know, I think it's, it's great. It, it, however, there's loads of different and interesting methodologies out there, but it's about how do you apply it? When do you apply it? And this is the, this is what's needed. Someone who understands the method, perhaps, and I, I wouldn't claim that I'm that I'm a statistician. I'm not, and I probably don't understand it as as well as as many others. But it is about can you can you can you can you be critically about how something is applied? And that is similarly that 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 that. You know, for, for other, you know, that that that's the same for other for other points. So I think, I think, I, you know, your point. I'm going to take this into another direction. Again, I'm criticizing Nice for that. For example, it is when we looked at when we looked at um, the titles of the people sitting on these guidelines, or at the method section, method um, guideline for the, for their methodology. Who they are uh, uh, recruiting, you know, where are the researchers? <laughs> there were no researchers on the list, and you sort of think, yes, of course, we need to include clinicians, patients, we need all of this, but where are the methodologists and the researchers sitting on these committees? Um, it, it was, you know, 
it, it was you know mind boggling. Um, so again, you do you do need you do need people with expertise, and I think you need them within the guideline development. Um, and of course, they have huge expertise. I mean, they have the technical teams who can you know who have who have the expertise. But again, it is also someone who has similar expertise who can then see, so oh, how do these experts apply the methodologies? Is it actually applied properly? And yes, sorry, like sort of waffling a bit to your mm. to your question. But I think sorry. I think I don't know if that makes a campaign successful. I really don't know. <laughs> so I have I one think comment. It makes the campaign successful. So so I have one comment there. Sorry, sorry, Felicitas. It's just um, I have a, r a little story about Felicitas from the first NICE meeting. So somebody in the NICE meeting, in the face of the criticism that they were getting from uh, the stakeholder group, said something like, oh, we have a lot of methodological experience. And Felicitas really brilliantly turned around and said, well, speaking as the head of the UK chapter of SPR, I would say that, which is the Society for Psychotherapy Research, I would say that we also represent considerable methodological expertise. And it was really interesting to watch that kind of, because I don't think maybe NICE are used to being challenged in that way about the, not about the, the findings, but about the how. So I, for me, I think it was really obvious rhetorically, um, how can I say interpersonally in that meeting that having research experts who could talk about research in the terms of the methodologists was very helpful in trying to make an argument with the the body that you're trying to influence because it's not it, it prevents anybody from saying well we understand it and you don't so um, yeah brilliant example of Felicitas is great um, in, uh, interpersonal uh, skills too Thanks. I'm aware that we have about three minutes left. There was one um, question, a little question from Emma earlier saying, do you know if any other guidelines have used NMA? I was wondering if one of the. Um, you know, I think I think NMA is 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 part of is what they're using at NICE. They don't obviously it depends on the analysis. So, you know, with in this depression guideline, so for example, they didn't use the depression because um, of, of of the layout of it. Um, so, but nice, basically, um, it's the it's the analysis that they're recommending. In again, I'm referring to to the um, the methods um, guideline, um, which basically is the is the. Sorry, I don't. I want to use um, what's the correct word. I'm, I'm missing the word. It's basically. Every every guideline development team gets it. It's their it's their instructions. So it's the it's it's how a guideline ought to be developed, and then it sets out what they need to use. So in a sense, a guideline development group has to adhere to that to some extent. I mean, I don't know exactly how they can how they can vary, but this is their this is their instructions, if you'd like. And I think network mass analysis and you know, I think I'm not wrong, but I might be obviously um, is network meta analysis is being recommended to use for certain obviously for, you know, to answer certain research questions. Um, so it is also used in other in other guidelines. Great, thank you very much. That's really helpful. Um, all right, so we're a couple of minutes out. If there are no more questions, um, uh, feel free to put uh, questions in the chat and um, Felicitas, you ought to be able to see the chat too, so you can participate that way. We are going to, in a couple of minutes, take a 10 minute comfort break because two hours is a long time to sit down. And what I'm going to ask Sam to do is to share the slides again um, in a moment um, with a word cloud. So we've got a question in our word cloud for Slido, so I'm going to encourage you, if possible, to go on to Slido and um, I'll post the um, the number that you need to put into Slido to participate to participate in the word cloud. Thanks very much. OK, so we're back in. I hope our audience is back with us. Thank you very much. Um, so um, Sam has brilliantly got the um, uh, Slido poll up so that you can see results from 14 people about what the switch to online therapy was like for them. Obviously, this is a question um, directed at the practitioners in the audience. Um, and it's really interesting, I always think, because there's quite a lot of, oh my gosh, it was quite scary. Um, and then there's also um, responses like skill enhancing, informative and challenging that suggests uh, um, that people have enjoyed it and enjoyed the, <coughs> the forced move. OK, so at this point, I'm going to, um, Sam, is it possible to go on to the next slide? 
Thank you. So I'm just going to um, turn over to Andreas at this point, who's going to start us off in this part of the session by talking about the CPD um, project with BACP. Thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Naomi. Yeah, so this is the second example or showcase of, uh, of an initiative. Um, this time it's an initiative that uh, is kind of a knowledge exchange project or a partnership between uh, academics from the Open University and BACP. Um, and um, it, it encom encompasses two aspects. Um, so one was a CPD production as a quick response. Uh, so CPD continuous professional development course as a quick response. Uh, to practitioners' needs at the beginning of the pandemic. And then the second part, then uh, follow-up research into the experience of those uh, practitioners that then informs training and a second uh, CPD course production. Uh, the next slide, please. So the background of all of this, as you, as you all, I'm sure all very well remember, in March 2020, when the first lockdown um, happened in the UK, government decided to lockdown. There was all of a sudden uh, a, a, a kind of a situation where mental health practitioners, counselors, psychotherapists, and most of them without any prior training or any experience in online work, where they were forced to move their work online. Uh, and at the same time, that meant that there was a threat to continued support for people with mental health uh, needs, especially at a time when the pandemic started, when there was uh, an increase in terms of stress, anxiety, trauma. So that was, if you want, an emergency crisis situation. And in response to that crisis or emergency situation, uh, Naomi and myself at EOU, together with the Open Learn Create team, worked together with the BACP to develop uh, uh, an online primer course, how to do counseling online, a coronavirus primer. And it was produced, the fabulous team of the Open Learn Create uh, people uh, produced it in 11 days uh, production process. Uh, so this launched in, in April 2020. And what it is basically, it's a six hour online course with interactive engaging instruction. Uh, and it provides kind of a, it's a primer. So it provides a basic understanding of the technology, technological, legal, eth uh, ethical, and practical issues in providing technology-based counseling, so video, audio, and text-based text counseling. And it can be done a self-paced, so people, and it's fr it was free, freely available. Uh, and it was great that obviously working together with BACP, it could be disseminate, disseminated through the BACP membership uh, and other and with other counseling organizations. So it reached a lot of people. The next slide, please. And it showed, I mean, the, the success and the numbers we had just so showed the huge demand at the time. So if, as you see on the slide, uh, after three months after the launch, we already had over 14,000 learners and over 7,000 who completed and got a badge uh, awarded for completing the course. Uh, and at that time, it was already clear this is the most successful ever course that Open Learn Create has ever produced. Um, the course has then been praised and lauded by practitioners and charities and counseling organizations. You have a quote here on the slide. It's a coincidence that this is a charity in Milton Keynes, where the EU is also <laughs> as, as the campus, but uh, you know, I think it's just an example. And then uh, around a year after the launch, so this April, April this year, we had 21, 000, over 21,000 participants and 13,000 batches. The course was highly welcomed at the time uh, uh, by charities, counseling organizations, practitioners, and the feedback we received showed that it really had a transformative contribution. It created more awareness amongst practitioners of the specific risks and the technology implications of working remotely. Um, and it, I think it supported for those co the cohort of counselors who were forced to go online, it, it, it really helped um, 
and supported the provision of safe and effective counseling uh, online at the time. The next slide, please. <clears throat> Obviously, the online primer was created as a first response in a crisis situation during the pandemic, uh, but it doesn't stop there. There is a need for CPD on online therapy beyond the pandemic. This is because the pandemic li is very likely to create long -term, a long-term shift. I mean, this is the prediction now that a lot of people share, that in future, uh, online therapy is probably here to stay. If it's, if it's maybe in a kind of blended approach, that there is face-to-face -face blended with online uh, counts or in-person together with online counseling, uh, and also as part of regular practice. And it could also be that a lot of clients might ask in future for online therapy after positive experiences during the pandemic. At the same time, there is a prediction, uh, the World Health Organization here is quoted, uh, of long-term mental health impacts of the pandemic on the global population, but also the population in the UK. So there is very likely to be an increased need and online provision has a, has can play a vital role in meeting those increased demands uh, and offers a highly uh, geographically accessible service that might be also more cost effective. However, there is training needs. I said this was just an online primer with basic with a basic kind of understanding and knowledge training, and one short CPD is not enough. BACP and the Association for Counseling and, Ther uh, Counseling and Therapy Online require formal training and competencies that are formally assessed. So clearly there is a need uh, for further training and further CPD. And also, next slide, please. There is a need to base uh, future training uh, on, on research evidence. Because at the moment there is there is there is research on online therapy, but before the pandemic, it was done with uh, client groups, specific client groups that used online therapy, or specific therapists who were highly trained in in, in online therapy. Since the pandemic, a huge amount of, of formerly not trained therapists uh, provided online therapy, and there isn't yet as much research on. Uh, how effective is that? What are the ethical issues there? Um, so there, there is a there is a need to conduct new research on counselors' experiences providing uh, online therapy during the pandemic. And our um, our aim with that research is also to inform a new CPD production. And both the research and the new CPD production is again uh, done in partnership with with BACP. Um, the aims of the new research was to add to the research uh, base on online therapy by exploring the experiences and perceptions of mental health practitioners working during the pandemic, uh, and, and importantly, based on that, at identifying practitioners' training needs and concerns around working online that could then inform the new CPD production. The methods we used it was a qualitative online survey. We had quite a high for an online, for a qualitative online survey, qualitative research, quite a, a high number in terms of the sample, 509, 590 counselors and psychotherapists. And the focus was on the, the experiences, on the perceptions of challenges and benefits, and uh, issues like ethical issues and risks in online. Uh, in online uh, provision of counseling and psychotherapy. We used a framework analysis um, and the research, as already mentioned, was conducted in partnership with BACP, which explains uh, the benefit of that, of course, is that we could reach a much higher number of participants through the BACP networks. The next slide, please. Just very quickly, um, the key research findings, we're, we are in the process of publishing a paper on that one. Uh, but uh, <clears throat> what I can already say now, uh, apart from uh, the, um, the findings that are very common in, 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 in online therapy research, we had some findings that were not so much covered in existing literature. So ethical concerns that were highlighted, working with trauma and complex presentations as seen as more difficult on one hand, although other practitioners in the same sample said it's, it's, it's somehow also more easy, can be done more easily. Uh, so there's a lot of ambiguity also in the sample. 
the need to adapt and work more creatively mm -hmm. online uh, and the issue that to contain emo the emotional and distress online, that that's much harder to contain the uh, therapeutic frame online. There is a whole list of key issues for training and practice practice adaptions. Uh, I'm not going through all the all the issues there. You can see it on the slides, um, um, and that obviously, as I said, informs then uh, the production of our new CPD course. Um, next slide, please. That new CPD course, we are uh, uh, at the final kind of stages of producing it, and hopefully it will be launched in the next in the next couple of months or three months or so. Uh, will be a 25-hour online uh, advanced uh, online therapy uh, course. So generally, and in terms of uh, the topic um, we have today for our symposium, symposium, I think generally. That partnership uh, we have with BACP in producing the CPD and doing the research and producing the advanced CPD course, it generally illustrates the value of academics working with external organizations in terms of mutual gain and increased impacts from research. And I can think of at least three benefits um, that we can highlight there that in, in terms of the crucial role of the partnership with BACP and these this kind of benefits are firstly uh, the collaborative engagement in research in CPD provides uh, access to participants and a wider dissemination of both the research um, but also then the CPD um, training that's tailored towards the need of needs of practitioners. Um, the creation of the CPD training uh, allowed us, the partnership with BACP allowed us to do this in a flexible and responsive way to meet the diverse professional um, needs of BACP members. And then the third benefit I see potentially is that there is a potential for income generation for both organizations and an increased social impact and institu institutional profile for both partners. And I'm really interested to hear the perspective of our BACP partner, because we have now Claire talking about the perspective of BACP on, on that initiative. Thank so you. Just, I was just thinking, Sam, maybe um, if you could stop sharing for a moment so that we can see Claire's face. That's all right. <laughs> Thank you. Is that all right? I hope that's, I hope that's nice for you, Claire. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure I would describe it as nice for me, but um, given that I'm, I'm going to be speaking with without slides, that, that works for me. Um, so uh, just to introduce myself a little, I'm Dr. Claire Simmons, I'm Head of Research at BACP. I've been at BACP for about five years now. Um, prior to that, I was working as a trainer, uh, a counselling trainer at the University of Leicester. Um, I'm, I'm sure many people here will be familiar with BACP, but um, for those who aren't, just to give a little bit of flesh on the bone. Um, so we're the British Association for Counselling and Psychotherapy. We are one of a number of professional bodies in the UK for counselling and psychotherapy that hold a register of counsellors and psychotherapists that is accredited by the Professional Standards Authority. As was mentioned in the chat a few minutes ago, we've got upwards now of 58,000 members. And um, most of those members, the vast majority are individual members, but we do have um, a small minority that are organisational members. And our members work in a, a whole range of settings and with, a, a you know, of course, a wide variety of, of client groups. Um, our members range from those who are currently undertaking their training um, to people with decades of experience. Um, and, and within that, they also have a range of educational and training backgrounds. So some have done their counselling training at FE level, at level four, for example, and some have master's degrees. Some have gone on to do um, PhDs and, and advanced research. And the reason I mentioned that is to kind of link back to a point earlier that was made about the kind of the range of experience um, of um, research and understanding research and sort of issues that we seek to work with in BACP about how palatable or not um, research might be to engage with for, for some of our members, which I guess will come out um, as I speak a bit more. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, BACP's strategy and to use um, the work that Andreas has talked about, but I'm also going to link back um, to what, um, what Felicitas has spoken about in terms of the stakeholder coalition, as both of these, I think, are examples of um, 
why research and seeking to achieve impact in research is important to BACP and what we're setting out to do and why we would particularly seek to collaborate or um, lend our weight or our voice to, to initiatives like this. So in terms of um, strategy then, BACP launched a three-year strategic plan in December 2019 and the stated purpose of that was to work with and for our members and for the benefit of the public to build the acceptability and credibility of the counselling profession. So you can see that's quite an overarching ambition. And underneath that, we have um, six strategic goals that we have articulated. I'm going to, um, I suppose, consider each of those in turn. And again, as I say, make links to the two initiatives that have been talked about. So goal one is that we will listen to, learn from and work with our members to inform the work of the association. So if we think about the, um, uh, the primer that was developed with the Open University and indeed the ongoing um, piece of work for a um, more in-depth CPD, both of those very much came out of feedback we were getting from members. At the time of the first lockdown, our members were saying very loudly and in large numbers to us that they needed support, they needed guidance from BACP about how to make this transition, how to work online. We've since done additional um, surveys with members to explore more about their experience of working online, as, as well as this piece of research with the Open University, which also tells us some more about some of their experiences and what their needs might be. Similarly, in relation to the NICE depression guideline, for years we have had members saying to us that um, they're not happy about uh, the lack of availability of counselling work in the NHS. They are not happy about the lack of choice for patients or types of treatment, and it is something that they want us to address. So it, it's very clear with both of these pieces of work that actually it's not only that BACP thinks the, these are good things to do, but our members are telling us that these are things that they need us to address. The second strategic goal is we will equip our members to be able to work in a fast changing world, to be able to influence and contribute to the well-being of society. I, I have a slightly wry smile here. I think we've all had um, quite an experience of um, how fast the world can change with the COVID-19 <laughs> pandemic and in a way that we just simply could not predict. So I think that's a very clear example of when, um, in spite of our plans of what services and, and uh, resources we might have planned to put in place for um, our members, that actually everything changed hugely and made a very was very influential on what we decided we needed to do next. We had to support the move um, to online working very quickly in order in order to uphold standards and to support the needs of the public who were seeing therapists or indeed then needed to see therapists. Third strategic goal is that we will be the professional home of choice for members and communities of practice, providing relevant services and opportunities to learn, develop and inspire each other. So I think what's key here in looking at these two pieces of work is providing relevant services and opportunities to learn again the the development of that in-depth cpd through research with the open university is a really key example of that you know making sure that it's relevant to what practitioners need and are telling us what are the dilemmas and the difficulties that arise in their online practice and offering them the opportunity to be able to to um, to tackle that and to learn about that but i think what's also really important here is the aspect of choice so as i mentioned earlier so many of our members find that reading research is not something that they want to do or that they enjoy or they feel comfortable doing or that they feel very equipped to do. And working with the Open University on these CPD resources has been really important because it means that we can make available resources to members to support their practice that are very much rooted in research, but it's presented in a way that's palatable to members, that's useful, it's digestible, and they can have confidence in the quality of those resources. They know that they're rooted in research because that's absolutely written into what they see, but they don't have to pick up a research paper to get that information if that's not their preferred method of finding out. Goal four of our strategy is the area where probably most of BACP research work sits, and that is that we will further develop confidence in and the credibility of the profession by developing and upholding professional and ethical standards informed by an evidence base. So uh, I think this kind of speaks to the theme of, of the day here. It's about it's not about research for the sake of research, but um, uh, research that makes a difference. 
Um, and, and key here is about research that makes a difference for BACP in terms of supporting the work of our standards team, supporting ethical practice and the benefits that that can have for clients. So developing um, the, the in-depth um, CPD with the Open University based on the research um, from um, a lot of our members and, and other counsellors and psychotherapists who are now working online is a really useful way, I think, of addressing what is needed to continue to support those high standards of work um, because it's based on the evidence from those practitioners themselves. It's live um, and it's not just our guesswork about what might be problematic. It's, it's real world evidence as from practice as it is now. I also wanted to mention, I suppose, that, that this, you know, our work to uphold standards and developing them in line with research evidence isn't just restricted to this work, as you might imagine, with the Open University. But, you know, very recently, BACP have updated their online and telephone competence framework, for example, to reflect more up to date research and to ensure that it's relevant for the current circumstances and the fact that the world of therapy delivery has changed. Um, and it, it seems so unlikely that it's going to return to what it was before. Goal five is that we will campaign for the appropriate provision of counselling and psychotherapy for all members of society and we'll campaign for opportunities for paid employment for our members. We will champion the skills, competence and contribution of our members to the public, employers, commissioners and policy makers. So as well as the work that we do in BACP, in the research team and the policy team to respond to consultations such as the NICE depression guideline consultation, um, and making sure that our responses are rigorous, robust, credible, supported by evidence and, and um, reflect our position. It's incredibly important to us that we support and maintain relationships with experts and groups and lend our weight and our voice to initiatives like the Stakeholder Coalition that Felicitas has talked about. And really that's about, I suppose, really we're always seeking to maximise the impact of our work and that we understand that we can achieve greater impact together and in collaboration than we possibly can on our own. We think that by being part of that coalition that supports the coalition and it's helpful to them that BACP is part of that, but it's also helpful to us to be part of a group um, that is, is, is speaking together um, about our share, shared aims there. And this kind of campaigning is a core part of BACP's work. We don't see it as achievable without the inclusion, without the integration of research evidence, which again links back to that point earlier about credibility. Um, policymakers, not, not only nice, but policymakers more broadly expect to see evidence when we make claims for what we're doing. And even though we may take issue with the types of evidence they prefer or they privilege, we can't expect to be taken seriously if we respond to them without speaking the language that they listen to. It's a bit like saying listen to us because we say so. And that's one reason that, for example, BACP funded an IAPT based RCT, the practice trial, which has recently been published um, its main findings, while also, as Felicitas pointed out, pushing for the integration of consideration of other forms of evidence. Um, for NICE to consider. So um, we seek to say, yeah, here's some RCT evidence. This is useful. And also listen to this because RCT evidence on its own is, is limited. And then our final strategic goal um, is, is really a kind of an efficiency goal. This is we will optimise the organisation of BACP to ensure it is flexible, responsive and capable of resourcing the vision and goals. This is really important, again, in relation to these two pieces of work because it's about remembering that as an association, we're funded almost entirely by members' fees and quite rightly, our members want to see value for money and to be assured that we're spending their money wisely. I've already demonstrated how the work that we've been involved with here has um, in, is in part about a response to what members are telling us they want us to do. But as I've said as well, collaborations of this kind allow us to get um, greater impact, more, more bang for our buck, if you like. And we think it's a very cost effective way of being able to work towards achieving what our members want us and need us to achieve. So to sum up, the work that we've talked about today represents only a fraction of what we're involved with in the research team at BACP, but hopefully it shows you something of the importance of research to BACP as an association. Um, <clears throat> 
uh, and also how BACP views research as essential within our profession um, and the importance of seeking to collaborate to maximise the impact of our work. So the work we've spoken about today contributes to every aspect of BACP's strategy, from listening to members and responding to what they tell us they need. It also contributes to the work of our CPD and membership team in providing services and resources for our members. And it supports the work of our standards and policy teams uh, in terms of contributing to the credibility of the counselling professions, upholding standards, campaigning for provision and choice for the benefit of all the public. Thank you. Thank you so much, Claire. That was really interesting. Um, oh. Sorry, I just muted myself mm. again. Apologies. So I was just trying to thank uh, Claire and um, we will want to go on and have a conversation, but I think given where we are in terms of the time, perhaps do we want to take a couple of questions about this portion and then do our panel discussion? Does that make sense to you, Lord? Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, so um, uh, I just had a, one comment from somebody who was saying that you, you um, that there was a lot of information on what you just presented, Claire. Um, and was asking about slides, so I've just said that we don't have slides, but hopefully we'll be able to um, share the recording afterwards if people want to catch up. So let yes, me just apologies for speaking so fast, but the information about our strategy is available on the BACP website if, if people want to, to find that there. Thank you, Claire. All right, so I just wanted to um, ask uh, if um, there are any questions from the audience and um, alternatively, um, maybe uh, proffer a question to all of you about um, or ask if there was anything that came up from either what Claire said or from what Andrea said about this sort of overall um, uh, uh, focus at the moment which is around the impact um, impact agendas sorry very incoherent aren't I sorry so the, 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 just at the moment this is a question about this last uh, presentation by Andreas and Claire So I guess I just wanted to ask a question um, actually of you, Claire, which is um, that I think it would be really helpful, I think, for the academics in the audience to understand more from your point of view um, about maybe what's what makes kind of collaboration around, um, for example, production of CPD useful. Um, well, I think that there's something about, uh, and this was really key in the production of the primer um, resource in particular, um, the, the access to um, resource and experience that meant that that was able to be turned around really quickly. Or see in, in BACP, we, we also produce resources and, and uh, training materials, uh, written, written resources and, and video content. But actually to be able to draw on um, it, it wouldn't have been possible for, to, for us to produce that kind of content at that sort of speed and to be able to have the kind of expertise and input to have the sort of the variety of the uh, methods of engagement in it. So, you know, a real advantage of working with the Open University, for example, is, of course, you know, your expertise around online um, kind of methods of, of learning. And that, that's really important, I think. Um, so it, I guess there's also a, an advantage which is to do with, um, uh, I'm sorry, I was going to say something and now my mind has gone blank. Uh, it's it's Friday afternoon, so maybe that will come back to me. So. No worries. So I think unless there's something that you wanted to add, Andreas, I was going to suggest that what we might do, Sam, is get you to share the question that we were going to ask the audience so that we can give people a prompt to point uh, to put questions in the chat. Um, so, Sam, if you don't mind sharing the slides again, that would be great for a minute. Yeah, so um, I'm not going to ask you guys to put that into Slido. Um, maybe you could um, put comments into the chat and then we'll pick them up through the discussion. Do you mind going on to the next slide at this point, Sam? Thanks. 
All right, so um, I really just wanted to introduce uh, um, Matthew Smith Lilly. Maybe you might like to say something about yourself, Matt. Um, but um, uh, you can see here that Matt has um, a, a history of being involved as a um, policy advisor at the British Psychological Society and is also the policy and engagement lead at BSCP currently and has been doing that that job for quite some time. So has a lot of experience in this area. So I don't know, um, Matt, if you want to start us off in our panel discussion, which is really about kind of what sort of lessons might we learn from the two pieces of work that we've discussed today about how to create impact in terms of um, counselling practice and mental health policy. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Naomi, and thanks everyone for having me this afternoon. Yeah, so um, I'm Matt Smith Lilly, I'm the Policy and Engagement Lead for Mental Health at BACP. Um, I've worked with uh, Felicitas for, for quite a while now, actually, on the, the NICE campaign that uh, she's spoken about already. And I've had involvement at BACP, <coughs> excuse me, for I uh, realised yesterday, um, it had been a decade since I started yesterday, so it's been a it's been a little while. And some of these things, like the NICE guideline for depression has been has been uh, going around for almost that entire time. So um, it's been quite interesting. Um, I guess to kick off then, to sort of say, I guess, using thinking about my experience um, to date and what I found uh, really useful and important when considering how research can have a, you know, a substantive impact on policy. I guess what I found is that research really builds credibility amongst decision makers and policy makers, particularly for, for us at BACP around counselling and psychotherapy. Um, it's incredibly important in adding a quality to our arguments. It turns them from you know, something that's purely values driven statement um, into something that is backed up robustly by evidence. And again, like I say, in my experience at times counselling can face a misunderstanding occasionally it can face some prejudice and mistrust amongst you know different professional groups commissioners politicians civil servants i should i should stress that um that that's changing and has been changing for for a number of years but i think that those those perceptions of counseling and psychotherapy as professional activities do need to be continually challenged and uh and research is a really you know, important and crucial way we can do that. Um, it's been touched upon already, really, but it kind of embedding a flourishing research culture amongst both practitioners and academics, I think is a really crucial step in this. Um, the breadth of research, we talked a little bit about the size of our membership alone, but the breadth of research that could be done by such a range of practitioners can really strengthen policy in a range of areas across across almost anything you can think of, really. Um, and I guess if we want to win the argument to secure more public funds in investing into psychological therapies, we, we really do need to have more robust evidence backing up what we're saying and, and, and ultimately demonstrating that they work, um, you know, and demonstrating to, to the people who hold the purse strings that it's a, it's a worthwhile thing to spend money on. And that's really crucial. Um, you know, the same applies really when we're arguing for a greater choice of interventions being made available. We've talked about, uh, Felicity has talked about choice um, being particularly important to the NICE campaign. You know, again, if we can't satisfactorily demonstrate, you know, the importance of choice in clinical outcomes, I, I mean, I think choice becomes a, a costly luxury for decision makers rather than, you know, a, a, almost a necessary feature of an effective service. So I guess it's kind of thinking, thinking like that. I mean, a couple of examples, I guess, of where we've seen research of having an impact, particularly at BACP. I mean, school counselling has been a has been a great area for us. Um, you know, when I first started at BACP, BACP had already had a couple of years of working with the Welsh Government evaluating a pilot that they uh, had been um, delivering on um, making counselling available in schools for secondary ch uh, aged children in Wales. And that progressed on into a statutory right for children between 11 and 18 to have access to counselling in schools. That's still going on now. And that, that, you know, there's a direct flow from, you know, from research demonstrate, you know, demonstrating that this was a worthwhile intervention to try, you know, evaluation of a pilot showing it was effective and that translating into what led, you know, primary legislation in Wales. Similarly, we've that's carried on over, over the years and 
we've now seen the Scottish Government invest £80 million in um, counselling in schools and colleges in Scotland that was uh, two two and a half years ago so that you know significant development again off the back of um, you know a prolonged uh, focus on you know research into this area and, and Claire's mentioned the practice trial you know my hope and it is you know it's a it's a great hope that this is going to have a significant impact on the development of the nice depression in adult guideline um, you know as Claire said it it talks the language of nice you know, there's flaws in what NICE do, Felicity has, has touched upon those, and there's lots of things that we would like to improve and change, but ultimately this trial speaks the language that they're asking for. So the results are positive, and we're hoping that as NICE go through their process of updating the guideline in the countdown to the consultation in November, that this is going to have a, an impact on, on policy at, you know, at, a, at the level of NICE. Um, Hopefully that gives you gives you some idea. Thanks so much, Matt. Um, so I, I wondered about any kind of response to to Matt's contribution, uh, perhaps from Felicitas or Andreas at the moment. Yeah, I'm I, I'm happy to because uh, I was in preparation for this uh, symposium. Uh, and hopefully I can relate it to to what you said, Matt. But in in preparation, I was thinking about research impact or research project that had were really successful in having an impact on policy, so specifically policy. And I'm really sorry, but what came to mind, <laughs> I say I'm really sorry because it, it, it's probably to, be, to become a bit cynical, but what came to mind was the depression report, Lord Layard, uh, which then obviously because of that report, uh, not because, but it was used, let's say, put it like that, to uh, argue that we need IAPT and we need a program and so much money was spent by the government for this IAPT program. So I was thinking, what was it about the Lord Laird report, the depression report, that it was so successful in you know, getting, having such an impact? And two, and that's why I say it's a bit cynical because two things came to mind. <clears throat> so Lord Laird's research was a bit of a, um, I think an economic analysis. So it looked into uh, how much money the government could save if they would, you know, in a, and, and it, it was a, if you want, it was quite a sim simplicit, simplicit kind of thing to do to link those two and was not, not looking at the whole and complex pictures of what makes people happy or not. It was a very simplistic one, but it followed a medical model, if you want. That was one factor. I, I identified a medical model has still better chances to be heard, to be listened to. And the second one was it fitted into a political agenda at the time. So, and that was, you know, a crucial issue there, I think. So probably that's something to, I don't know, if, if research impact want to be successful, it's definitely helpful if the political agenda, uh, you know, speaks to it and it's fitting into a politi political agenda. Does that, yeah. Looks like Matt has a response there. Uh, yeah, thanks, Andreas. Yeah, I'd actually made um I'd made a series of bullet points that you know Naomi had um had sent me a question yesterday, you know, to say um what almost like what advice would I give to researchers when they're thinking about how to have impact on policy? And I've made a few bullet points of things that I've thought about over the years and that um uh, have always kind of stuck with me. And I think yeah, you know, Andreas, you've touched upon uh, you know. By, well, two of that, both of those things that felt it featured on my list. You know, economic analysis is incredibly important. I mean, it, it, for pol politicians, and you know, let's say at that level of policy making, you know, the cost of a policy, along with you know the legality of what you're trying to do, are, are number one. You know, I know there's two things there, but they're they're tied for number one on the list of things that are uh, most important to policymakers, because you know it's got to be affordable or the cost is at least going to be palatable and you know of course it has got to you know fit within the law and unfortunately scientific evidence comes somewhere down the list um and i think we can probably all point to examples over the last few years where you know almost like the death of the expert you know you know experts being uh, marginalized in public discourse because it's seen as um almost a luxury to, to be an expert and, and not um, 
I guess almost not based in reality, based in a you know a, almost a position of privilege. Um, and the and the other thing there is around whenever you politicians have got societal challenges they're trying to solve and they've got political realities that they're trying to deal with and policies really never ever develop from scratch um doing that is really not really an option so when um you know when policymakers are, are looking for suggestions and when i guess when researchers are, are thinking about how research can have impact i guess moving away from this idea of if we could start from scratch or if we had a blank piece of paper because we just don't have one of those and, and politicians don't um, have the luxury of being able to start with one so actually almost you've almost got to take a pragmatic approach and accept some of the uh, situation that we're in work with that and try and move it incrementally towards a position that's um, you know that's, that's, that, that we we may see as better you know um, but it is a slow, you know, it is a slow process. Um, but yeah, I just thought that was interesting, Andreas, because both of those, you know, I'd written both of those things down. They, uh, they're both key features, but they're, they're things that I think we have to try and work with um, and navigate around. Um, I don't think I, they won't be going anywhere. I think that's just they're just a reality of, of policy making. I think. Thanks so much, uh, Matt. And I just note a comment from Rebecca in the chat, um, which gives a reference from uh, what sounds like a really useful paper. It talks about the the what was behind uh, Layard's ability to get, not personally, but as part of a team to get IAPT off the ground. Um, so you might want to check that out. Um, Felicitas, I wondered if you might have a response to any of the above, partly because I was thinking that one of the things that you, you recommended is that it's of course, cost is very, very important, but that maybe NICE needs to separate out the, the decisions around cost effectiveness from the decisions around the, what the scientific evidence is saying. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I just, I, I, I guess my, my own opinion is, is very much that it needs to be separated. I mean, it's a good question where, where it should lie, you know, but I suppose I think cost analysis are very complex in itself. You know, and all the sort of economic um, analysis of of treatments um, that we have at the moment is is quite it, it's quite limited in general. I mean, and and it begs the question: if we're looking at a cost analysis of a psychotherapy carried out in the states, carried out in Germany, carried out in wherever, it, can we actually apply this to the UK or or the other way around? You know, and you know, it, you know, I think. Um, was it you, Claire? I can't remember. Someone made made the point earlier of um, again applicability, and we're using I think no mute was you, um, you know, using evidence from other countries. Um, and how far can we can we apply these these findings? So that that's one of the questions. But it's also I suppose it comes back to an argument what I made earlier in the sense of where what level are we at? So I think it, and it it's it's a really difficult position for Nice to be in. Or for you know guideline development group that, that overall uh, accepted criteria for how to how to you know for exclusion inclusion criteria and meta analyses you know I mean we we are trying to develop them in the scientific community but it's it's difficult you have to make choices um, you know and, it's, and you have to and, and I guess we are still sort of trying to figure out where you know where are the parameters. You know, and, and and that's what obviously a, a, a guideline development group um, has to has to make as well. So I'm not I'm not saying that there are guidance out there that they're not using necessarily. It is it is something we're still needing to kind of um, figure out. But I'm saying that I think at this level, I think you know they need to use what what is sort of available rather than developing their own. You know. And or they can develop their own, but it needs to be it needs to be peer reviewed. It needs to be fed back. So that brings me to this other point, which is which is I think about a dialogue, you know, a dialogue between between the different levels, and in this case also a dialogue between the stakeholders, um, you know, rather than this sort of top down approach that obviously is is, is prevalent in in nice. Um, 
You know, it's interesting when you when you talk, Matt, I was sort of, you know, I was sort of thinking about another example, which is um, that's more relevant, I guess, on a, on, a, on a professional personal level. So I was I was, um, you know, working on the Tavistock Adult Depression Study and it, the, the, the TAD study was developed um, I don't know, in the 90s by Phil Richardson and colleagues in order to get psychodynamic psychotherapy or the, this study into the NICE guidelines. So it was from the, from the protocol onwards. You know, so, you know, a randomized control trial was designed with all with everything in place in order to actually be considered so that it can be considered for in order to kind of obviously impact on policy and impact on, on, on um, so that the research can feed in whatever it found it. So it was from the onset designed to be whatever the results would have been. So, and it's interesting, it's, I mean, we see a long-term trial like this is, is costly, it takes time, um, you know, and, um, you know, what wasn't then, you know, we weren't ready in 2009 for, 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 for that guideline. So obviously, you know, um, but what's interesting to see now, and that makes me so sad, that the that the study um, was included in this in this review, but was completely castrated. So then you sort of think, well, if you see something like that, it's 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 rather um, disheartening. So you know, thinking back, you know, how and how can what what can we you know that that you know how can we deal with that? And was castrated just briefly is that you know it was a study that again from the outset was a was 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 designed to be a longitudinal trial with a follow up. So our outcome most our you know that was at the end of follow up, not at the end of treatment. And it made sense. It was a rationale for that provided. But they looked only at the evidence at the end of treatment, which wasn't significant. So they're deducting from that, having basically ignored two time points, data time points, they are deducting and saying psychodynamic treatment for this patient group isn't effective. It's not, not true. So it's an example of um, but it can be disheartening when you set out to do research in order to change policies, in order to make an, an, a change, an impact um, is, is, is then being ignored. And if that happens, well, I suppose that's the case, if that sort of happens, you know, how, how can we, you know, how, how can people be motivated to doing that? And these trials are in whatever, you know, you know, even shorter trials, they're expensive. So um, yeah, I think, I guess I that, think that, that Claire, comes that's really, really helpful. Thanks. Really interesting, Felicitas. Uh, I think Claire has a comment and then Matt. Yeah, I was going to say, because uh, the, the sorts of aims that you're setting out there are, are kind of similar to what we set out to do as BCP in, in funding the practice trial. As I mentioned earlier, that was um, based in IAPT and that was a non-inferiority trial looking at CBT and person-centred experiential therapy. Um, and um, uh, that those findings have just been published. Uh, I, I think that the point I wanted to kind of pick up from what you're saying is it, it's not only what can be disappointing in terms of what gets done with that, those sort of trial findings, but, but how hard it is to have um, a sizable impact with one RCT in the face of, um, you know, a whole tranche of, of RCTs, however flawed and limited they might be, um, uh, that, that um, you know, th there's a lot of RCT evidence that is used by NICE around CBT uh, as an intervention. And that, you know, as you say, um, there, there are incredible complexities um, around, you know, simply having an RCT in the first place. They're costly, making them large enough so that they actually have the kind of the statistical um, validity that is needed to, to make any kind of claims at all. Um, and to, to be caught up in, in trying to kind of um, develop that kind of evidence and knowing that we're not in a position, you know, B BACP can't fund 20 RCTs. We cannot do that. In any case, we're also seeking to challenge, you know, the, the, the privileging of that kind of evidence. But, it, but it's very hard, um, I think. And as you say, it, it can be um, disheartening knowing that, you know, the best, ev the best efforts and showing evidence that actually is of the sort that they want and which says actually yeah look as we're saying from other evidence that the, the flavour of therapy is not really the thing that makes a difference there's no difference um but then having it sort of slapped down again 
And I, I think for me, it also links to the point that, that Andreas was making about the medical model and some of the privileging of, of the, um, uh, the, the evidence and the history and the credibility that goes along with um, the voices and the groups that come from psychiatry, come from psychology, perhaps. Um, of course, there's overlap between us, but, but I think that's really difficult to, to, to tackle. I think we're coming to you next, Matt. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I was just going to I was just going to pick up on um, the point that Felicitas was making really about the, the you know, the challenge with influencing NICE. I, I, what I was going to suggest, I think, to try and, I guess, give them uh, an encouraging message for people, you know, thinking about what's the point in doing research to influence policy anymore, I guess. If you separate, you've got to separate out different policy makers. I think that's that's important. Um, NICE are a special case in lots of ways, and you know we can talk about those a little bit more in a second. But I think if you think about politicians and civil servants, people who are making uh, decisions at a governmental level, whether that be the Westminster government, you know, governments in Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, or you know, albeit abroad, I think the things to to put to bear in mind are, you know public opinion matters to them. It's really important. They're elected. If they're a politician, they're accountable. So you've got to take account of what pressures they're facing that, that yes, we might think are not, um, shouldn't influence the decision, but actually are a reality of the situation they're facing. Um, you know, policy making is never perfect. Somebody's always going to be disenfranchised. You know, if you make tax cuts, somebody's going to benefit, somebody's not. If you're going to, you know, if we're going to make recommendations about what treatments are going to happen, there's going to be things that still are inside and outside. Policymakers don't expect it to be perfect. Um, what they are looking for is something to try, something that they can have a go at something they can pilot, they can evaluate and they can see what impact it has, whether it helps solve some of those challenges that they're facing and that they've identified that they want to try and tackle. And of course, different political parties are going to have different priorities in which in which things they want to tackle. Um, you know, so I guess it's always worth thinking, how can you Um, uh, uh, time in role of a minister is about 18 months before they're either fired or they're moved on into another portfolio. And I guess if you think about what somebody who seeks front bench politics is probably after, it's after some kind of legacy and it's after probably the next big job. So multi-year research is not going to cut the mustard there. Of course, you could get lucky. You could get a multi-year research thing that ends at a time when somebody's in post. But you can't plan to do multi-year research with a minister or a secretary of state in post. It's so you've got to be you've got to be swifter of foot. Um, but you know, equally, they are looking for legacy. So you know, bringing them an idea that you know is back to you know it's almost let's say it's the best guess, and I'm sure that's an anathema. Um, I'm the only person on the panel with that doctor before my name, so I can get away with that. But I'm sure it's an anathema. Um, but it is worth bearing in mind, you know, like I say, the, you know, like I say, this lifespan of uh, of ministers. Um, and, you know, I guess the, part, the other thing is, um, and this probably won't be very popular, uh, we need more research. It's not an answer that policymakers want to hear. Um, it may be true, absolutely may be true. Um, but you know, going going into a meeting or making a proposal that is asking for funding for more research is probably going to fall on deaf ears. And if I think back to what happened, you know, particularly with Layard, Layard, I agree, it was very simplistic maths, but basically said, you know, it's costing £750 a month to have somebody out of work. If you put them through a course of treatment, it will cost £750 a month as a, you know, a very good chance they'll go back to work for at least one month, it become cost neutral. And I get it, that could be written on the back of a Benson and Hedges packet, but actually it wins a political argument because it doesn't need to be super complicated. Actually, it just sounds like it could work. Let's give it a go. Um, I agree, nicer, nicer a different kettle of fish because they set out such a strict, um, you know, a strict mandate for what evidence they will accept and won't accept. And, um, you know, I mean, Felicitas have had a number of meetings um, over the last few years, you know, discussing how best to tackle this. Um, NICE do have a mandate for looking at economic uh, 
cost effectiveness. That is part of why they were, why they were set up in 1999. So if if we don't want them to do that, and you know I you know I agree with what you said, Felicia, then we have to take that argument to a political realm and away from nice. And we need to make that argument to well, ultimately the Secretary of State who could make that who could make a change. So there are avenues, but they're just different avenues. So in terms of influencing that policy, um, what I would say about nice is they do have a way of doing things. They do have a guideline manual. They do update the guideline manual. But I would encourage everybody and anybody to respond to any consultation on NICE that that you feel passionate about. Um, they have strict rules about who can respond and who can't respond and who they will uh, accept responses from and all this. But actually, who's going to stop you from responding to the consultation and simply getting weight of numbers saying that what you're doing is or isn't appropriate. So, um, like I say, separate out the different types of policy makers. They've got different, uh, I guess they've got different rules backing what they're doing and different approaches, but also to try and encourage people that it isn't hopeless. Um, you know, there are other avenues, you know, political decision makers can still invest in services. They do, they, you know, they find ways, nice guidelines are just guidelines, albeit incredibly influential ones that sometimes feel like law. But, um, but they are, you know, still in theory um, guidelines. Um, I realise that's a bit of a ramble, and it went on for a bit, and I know Andreas wants to say something, but um, yeah, just wants to get that in there. Really. Thanks so much. I think, by the way, it's really, really helpful to hear your 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 thoughts about what researchers need to think about. And I've written a little note to myself, which I'm going to pass on to another research team that I'm working with. Anyway, turning to you, Andreas, we've got about four minutes left. Thanks so much. Oh yeah. Uh, okay. I mean, this is just a. I mean, uh, this is just a thing that I thought when I heard Claire before talking about, you know, professional memberships like BACP can maybe fund one R RCT, don't have the funds to do more. Um, so I, I was thinking, what, what is the best strategy? Um, and I know there is a discussion within BACP membership, should we spend so much money for RCTs? What could we do with that money otherwise? Um, so, you, and you could argue in that, if you follow that logic, if we can't really, if we try to play the game, but don't have the resources, and can only have, you know, then, then we can never be successful, like Germany playing cricket or something like that. I mean, that never would lead to anything. But um, sorry, I don't want to offend any German cricketers, but um, just as an example. But but I mean, I know there is a discussion within BACP, and maybe if you think that logic, maybe it would be it would be useful or, or wise to say, let's rather work on. The awareness of politicians that there is other research, there is qualitative research. So service user involvement is, is very big on the agenda at the moment. And if qualitative research, you know, shows how service users feel about things or, or, or services, and, and so so rather maybe or not rather, it's probably on uh, in addition to RCTs or, or uh, doing that as well. Uh, but I know it's 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 difficult to to do everything. But yeah, just wondered about that. Um, so I think it's uh, Felicitas is, is, is got a response to that. Just very briefly, I mean, I guess that was sort of my point I was making. I mean, in a sense, if we think about psychotherapy and the evidence for, for psychotherapy outcome, I think we have enough evidence, I think. We have done enough RCTs. OK, granted, there are some psychotherapies where we need a few more. But overall, we have shown again and again that psychotherapy works. So I suppose we should therefore, you know, and Andreas, in your response, you know, direct our research efforts in I think we've lost sound there for a moment from Felicitas. Okay. I think what Felicitas is making a, a comment about the importance to focus on process, which is the question of how therapy works. Sorry, Felicitas, we just lost you there. So I was just saying that I think you're making an argument about the need to do process research, which is around um, understanding how therapies work rather than whether they work. Um, yeah. We need to. And for whom? For whom? Um, for whom? That, that's sort of, you're talking about choice, and this is where uh, um, Andrea's points come in. You know, we need we need to we need to combine, and we need to listen to people 
what they want and what help has helped them with the evidence in order to figure out for whom is which therapy the best approach. Yeah. OK, um, I suppose one other comment I just wanted to make before we finish is having just spent several days at the psychotherapy, um, the Society for Psychotherapy Research Conference, which is um, probably the, 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 depending on where you stand, the, the, the biggest uh, research conference in our area. I was struck by the distance between the complexity of the research, both qualitative, mixed methods, statistical, big data, data driven, algorithms, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, and how politicians understand research. And my experience while working at the ACP, not with Matt, I should hasten to add, with um, other people in the senior management team about saying, you know, when you're asked a question about what the research says about X, uh, go, well, some of the research says this and some of the research says that but there's problems with research like this and there's this and you have to think about and you know caveats 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 yeah you know, I just want a clear answer here that I can take into my next meeting I want to be able to say that the research says and so I think that's the other thought I'm having just listening to all of you that is a barrier is that as researchers we're trained to think complexly and critically um, but actually in policy context what you want to be saying is something quite simple um, and compelling and uh, that will work. I'm, I'm not being down on politicians here. I'm just thinking about how how arguments get understood by diverse groups. Um, so, all right, really um, very interesting. And uh, do check out the chat, people. There's some very interesting comments also from Claire and um, Matt. But I want to hand over at this point and we need to go back if that's possible, um, uh, Sam, to the slides. And Andreas is just going to draw us to a close um, and also hopefully say thank you to our panel because I realise as I'm saying this that I haven't properly said thank you. Thanks. Sorry, Andres, you're muted. OK, uh, I was unmuting, but I then was muted again. Anyway, so thanks, Naomi, for for that. And of course, I mean, the first thing I should say, thanks so much to uh, Claire and Matt from BACP and Felicitas from SPR uh, for joining us today. And I thought it was really interesting and a really fruitful, useful uh, session we had together. So thanks so much. What I'm doing now is uh, not only wrapping up our um, session this afternoon, but in a way the whole day uh, in terms of the launch week of the new Open Psychology Research Center, because we've now reached the, the end of the day, we've also reached the end of the week. So this was the launch week, if you want. Uh, today, just to as a quick, quick uh, wrap up, uh, a quick summary, we had today this morning uh, a full program today with three stimulating and thought provoking presentations in the morning. So we had Darren talking about the stories of sexual citizenship and the contemporary battles concerning sexual citizenships, Graham Pike's presentation on harmful evidence and evidence harm in the criminal justice system, and Gemma's talk on her research on mobile phone use by drivers, which also really showcased how research has been used to contribute to policy practice and education in her area. Uh, so a nice link then to our session this afternoon. And I should say, don't worry if you've missed all of this or some of it, because I understand that all the material will be curated on the center website. So and will be available to uh, to be watched after the launch. Now, uh, just a very quick uh, look ahead in terms of what happens next week. Next week is kind of the culmination of the launch events for with the formal opening of the Open Psychology Research Center on Tuesday, the 6th of July. So we have three keynote speeches on the day. And these three keynote speeches um, uh, have been kind of proposed by the three st strands of the new research center. So they were asked to kind of nominate, if you want, or suggest uh, prominent figures in their, in their world. So what we have is Professor Anne Phoenix from UCL Institute, Institute of Education. Uh, she was suggested by the culture and social psychology research strand. Then we have Professor Helen Spandler from the University of Central Lancaster, proposed by FEW, which is the Psychology of Health and Wellbeing strand. And then we have uh, uh, Professor Lawrence Allison from the University of Liverpool, who was suggested by the Forensic Cognition Research strand. So that promises to be a really 
interesting day on, on Tuesday. Uh, each keynote will be followed by strand members as discussions, and there will also be short introductions from the Open University's Vice Chancellor, Professor Tim Blackman, and from the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Social Science, that's Professor Ian Fribbens. And then uh, the last thing I want to briefly talk about is an outlook in terms of SPR. So I'm putting now my SPR hat on. Uh, SPR is probably uh, having a busy year, the next academic year, I guess, because uh, we're organizing um, the event today was the opening event for a program of monthly free SPR online events in 2021-22. And these events will include methodology workshop, lectures, research presentations by doctoral and early career researchers and panel events like the one today. And then um, the last thing just to, to announce to say is that we'll have a UK chapter conference, a one-day conference in Leeds uh, on the 9th of April, which is planned as a, I think it's called, you could say hybrid conference, right? So we will have an in-person part and we have an online um, part of the uh, online accessible part of the conference, 9th of April 2021. So put that into your diary if you want. And we already have keynote speakers confirmed. Two keynotes from Professor Michael Barkham uh, and then Dr. Jocelyn Cathy talking about child and adolescence um, psychotherapy and counseling in the UK. So that's the outlook, um, and I guess that's the very end of our session today. Thanks again to everyone who contributed uh, to that session, and uh, all, I, all that's left is to wish you a really lovely, restful weekend. Thank you.